Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 271. Email. The triumph and the torture. Now this is another instalment in our Rescue Yourself ourselves series and look I thought this was going to be a minor issue I was quite interested in the changing research in and around email particularly since COVID since the pandemic and I wanted to address the role of emails in thinking about our daily research and working life but I thought oh look it's a bit small it might be seen to be a bit boring and then a colleague of mine when I said oh look I'm thinking of doing an email one he said to me it's amazing how something so small can either strengthen your career or destroy it in a single message. End of quote. Hashtag no pressure. So, wow, I didn't really think how significant this would be uh, before I started to do this research. And I'm really glad in this series we're now looking at email because I was terribly interested in how the patterns of our research and our teaching and our working life have been altered, truncated, transformed by something as so simple and seemingly banal as email. So I wanted to explore using the most current research how we can transform our current environment and render ourselves not only more efficient but perhaps a little bit more centered and a little bit calmer to do the actual important work. So emails are obviously the zombies of digitization. They eat at your sense of self and indeed they certainly eat at your available time. And emails are changing. I did an internet studies, who knew that was a thing? I did an internet studies qualification in the late 1990s and email was quite an important chunk of that course because it seemed to be the archetype of effective asynchronous communication. But it was treated very much as another form of a fax. So we've moved beyond the fax and now we have email. But I would argue email now, over 20 years later, emails are completely different entities, basically transformed through law, through freedom of information requests, and with messages now being sent to hundreds of people. And then that message, whatever is said in that message, then we have a screen grab, and that's then shared on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. Great. So one email that you send in one minute can be catastrophic for your research, for your working life, for your career. So let's save ourselves. Let's see how we can do this and rescue your time and your confidence through email. This minor matter has become increasingly important through the recent research, and even I was stunned by the, this. So the current research is showing that one quarter of our working day, one quarter of our working day is spent handling email. And this study was from the McKinsey Global Institute. And in the study, they confirmed that sending and receiving emails, that is the second most time-consuming job in our daily life, second only to our actual job, the roles and responsibilities of the job that we do. So the Hiver Review confirmed that the average worker, mm -hmm, the average worker receives 121 emails a day. Most of us would probably dream of 121 emails a day. But it was shown in the behavior patterns of people managing those emails that they check their emails every 30 minutes for 12 hours. And then the stress of doing that endless checking for 12 hours has also been studied. So another study from Cypher shows that the average worker, again, average worker, big, big parameters here, but the average worker spends 13 hours a week on email alone. 
Wow. And this means that there are, and yes, it has been counted, 269 billion emails sent every day. And that's 149,513 emails that are sent every single minute. Okay. So this is a nightmare. <laughs> An absolute nightmare. And can I say, it wasn't always thus. Now, I started my first academic job in full-time academic job in 1994, when dinosaurs, yes, were still roaming the earth. And can I say, emails were just entering into that pretty conservative traditional history department. And unbelievably, 1994, about three or four emails might be received every day, maybe three or four. And so our working days were spent, unbelievably, I know, with research <laughs> and with teaching and with talking with people, communicating with colleagues about ideas. Now, I'm probably the last generation of academics that actually remember this period. And I also remember that it was actually possible to run a meeting without a Microsoft calendar, without Outlook beeping that it's 15 minutes to go until your meeting. Now, look, email is excellent. I find email an absolute gift. It's a great communication tool, asynchronous communication tool, because I can communicate with any colleague anywhere in the world. And if treated properly, it's a respectful communication. So I send it from an Australian time zone and it goes to my colleagues in Johannesburg, goes to my colleagues in Bristol, and they can manage that at a time that suits them. That's respectful for everybody. That's good globalization. So email is brilliant. It is the best example of being respectful of your time and respectful of someone else's time if you treat it properly. But what's happened is, in these sort of 20 years or so, is email, a strong asynchronous platform, has got confused with instant messaging, direct messaging, text messaging. So email is great for what it does for work communication, but really don't blur it with other interfaces. It's not a text message. If you would like to communicate in a short clear and professional way with another human, perhaps with an attachment, it is a tremendous way to do that. Email is a nightmare if you use it like Tinder, if you use it like Instagram, or you use it like direct messaging. Email is a tool for the workplace. It is not a dating app. Trust me. It's not a <laughs> it's not a platform to express your rage at capitalism after you have consumed seven Chardonnays. It's not your strategy to enact revenge on a person that you despise by sending them an email and ruining their day. It is a site of professional communication. And it's used so badly now because we've blurred it with all these other platforms. So in this Rescue Yourself series, let's peel this back. Let's look at email and let's look at how we can stop email taking over our researching and teaching lives. Okay, now I know, and this is an important moment of the vlog that we're going to share right now. I'm aware that a lot of PhD students are frightened of your inbox. You're so terrified by the messages that are coming in that you've started to stop even opening it because you're frightened of what you're going to find. I get about one student in my office a week that is too frightened to open their inbox. Now, I understand that. I had a, a working period in my life when I was a full professor, a working period in my life where on a daily basis, someone was sending truly shocking messages to me and I had to open the inbox and I had to answer it because that was the job. But I certainly understand that 
feeling in your stomach where you're frightened about what you're going to find, okay? So we're going to manage some of that emotion today. And I also want to log that that, that dreadful experience that a lot of our students are going through, this is not an individual's problem. This is a workforce and a workplace problem. This is a university problem. And we need to change, all of us, as an intellectual community, we need to change our behaviour. So let's rescue ourselves from email. Ten tips, let's do this. One, really, really important, understand your current behaviour. Crucial. Now, if you're about to change your behaviour, you have to actually understand today what you are doing. What is your relationship with email? So it is time to get out your watch, get out your phone and start to time, put your stopwatch on, time the amount of time that you're spending on emails. How much time are you spending working through that inbox? And start to log those periods on your Microsoft calendar because you can't change your behavior if you haven't logged and understood your behavior. So once you see with some horror how much time you are spending on emails then you can recognize firstly the time that you are wasting through inefficiency and then come up with some strategies to manage the transformation in your working and research and teaching day so how much of your life is actually passing with absolutely no purpose so how can we prepare your schedule for a new reality. So monitor your behavior, monitor your use of time, and look at how you're wasting time, how emails are leaking time from your life. Two, set a time to read and answer emails. Set a time. Now my version of this rule is not set a time to read emails. What I do is set times where I don't read emails. A lot of my job involves emails, a lot of my job, so I have to go the other way. What parts of my working life, what parts of my life will I not read emails? And that works for me. So I never read emails before 7 a.m. in the morning, and I never read emails on the weekend. Now that's new for me, that's new for this job. And all my other jobs, it all bled everywhere and it was a bit of a mess. When this job started, because I was modeling behavior for our PhD students, I made sure that email is treated as a working correspondence, a working mode of communication. So it is managed during a working day and it is not managed on the weekend. Okay, so that was new for me. I've done it for this job and it's worked very well because it means during the weekend, I can now do the much larger, more complicated job jobs that require a little bit more focus and concentration. Because like most of us, I could be answering emails all day, every day, seven days a week. But what I now do is I pick these periods and I put it in my calendar. And during those periods, I work on email with incredible intensity, knowing that during the other components of the week, I can do the big jobs with focus, with intensity. So what I do is I now have, and I put it in my calendar, these are the periods for the emails. I treat it like a meeting with myself. I set appointments with myself and I stick to them. Now, these are some good strategies, I think, that can work in managing your email. The two that are studied are 10 minutes every hour you work on emails, right? 10 minutes every hour. So that's been shown for some people to work incredibly well, okay? I would find that difficult because I would find they would bleed into the rest of the hour, to be honest with you. But 10 minutes in an hour, if that works, do that. The other great strategy, which again has been studied with success, are these blocks of intensity, two hours, one hour of intensity. That works well to get through the box. Three, crucial. Do not leave your emails open all day and do not attach your emails to your phone. It is the path to madness. <laughs> now, look, 
we all know this, I think we do know this, we're being honest today, the beeps, the endless notifications are basically destroying people's lives and they're certainly destroying your focus. Emails are a dreadful distraction, truly appalling distraction. And of course, as we all know, you can't multitask. Multitasking is nonsense. And again, the studies have shown that multitasking actually reduces your productivity. You know, we need to think about this research. And I think there's a much bigger problem with emails because what emails do is they create confusion for us, particularly as scholars, because they're low value products, right? Emails confuse us so that we forget what's actually important. We forget there are high value projects, your research, your PhD, high quality teaching, you know, having a job, making some money, right? These are important components of your life. Therefore, limiting the time you spend on email allows you to focus on the important tasks. And if you're endlessly on emails, you think you're terribly busy. Remember, busy? I'm not busy. I'm full. You think you're busy, but actually you're not. You're not doing anything important at all. You're just looking at emails. Now, if you can't control yourself, and this is quite important, if you're at that stage where it's on your phone and you know just, there's an email and I'll answer it, if you've become to that point, what I would advise is you set your software to only deliver emails at a particular time. So perhaps give yourself two hours or three hours each morning that you're doing significant work without the email interruption. Okay, so so then at that point, so you get your emails delivered at 11 o'clock and then they flood into your inbox. And that'll be great because then you can start to learn the information literacy to manage it without the hardware software intervention. Also, if you just can't manage it, <laughs> if you're at the point where you really are attached to your inbox, then you know what? Get offline for a while. Turn off your router. Just just tur turn off your engagement with the internet. Do the work. And then when you're actually ready and you're learning how to manage the emails, put the internet back on in your life. Four, here it is. Don't confuse the urgent with the important. Emails have rotted our brains so that we now endlessly confuse the urgent. Now, 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 now. We've confused the urgent with the important. Now, some hashtag random puts that damn red exclamation mark on their emails. You know those people? Now, the moment somebody's put that red exclamation mark on their email, they have said to you, my time is more important than your time. My time, this is urgent to me, therefore it must be urgent to you. They have disrespected you. So when you see that red exclamation mark, what I do, for example, because I'm an old goth, so when I see the red exclamation mark, I engage with that email last. <laughs> and when I reply, I do the little blue arrow. You very rarely see it in emails, but I'm a big fan of it. The blue arrow, you just attach that, which just means not important. Not important, just when you get to it, hope it all goes well. Don't confuse the urgent and the important. Five, here we go. Recognize that only 10 or 20% of your emails matter at all. Now, only a few emails are important, and invariably they're not the ones with the red exclamation mark. And can I say, those few emails that are important are life-changingly critical. Okay, so my first job every morning as I move through the emails to start my working day is I firstly delete all the junk I delete all the junk, all the rubbish, however you define that, go through and delete the rubbish first, gone. Don't even think about it, bang, 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 delete, delete, gone. Then, read and delete, or read and file the emails that you have been CC'd into, along with half of South Australia. Find, great, delete, find, great, file. Okay, now then at this point, depending on your job, you might be left with one email or 20, or maybe 200. Now these, these, you need to prioritize. These are the 
of your emails that are responsible for 80% of your success in your PhD and your working life or your survival in your PhD and your working life. These are the people that are going to attack you. These are the people that are going to send your response to half of South Australia. They're going to do a freedom of information request on you. They're going to send your reply on to the Vice Chancellor. This is real. So you know what? Look at these emails. Take the time and do answer them as if your mother or the Vice Chancellor is going to read them because the chances are they will and probably lawyers as well so put a lot of attention into those 20 percent of your emails six realize that you don't have to reply to every email this one changed my life now if people are sending you a lovely message and it is lovely when people send you a lovely message that's absolutely tremendous right you don't have to reply back to them with the same same level of fervor. Now, I get a lot of wonderful emails. They're lovely, and I reply and go, thank you so much, you're wonderful, with every best wish, T, right? And I delete the email, or I save it in what I have, what's called a, a nice email. So I have a nice email folder, so I either save it in that, or I do a quick reply, thanks for playing, gone. Now, remember, emails are not letters in a Regency drama. OK, just because somebody is oversharing, you don't have to act the scene with them in Bold and the Beautiful. OK, you don't have to go into the drama with them. Now, if you're on the CC line, read it, delete it, read it, file it, never, never, never reply. You're on the CC line. You're listening to a conversation in a bar. You're not being talked to. You're listening. Ooh, that's interesting. Right. Now, I'm going to add another crucial point here. Please hit the delete button. Okay? I assess my success every day with email by how many emails I delete. Seriously, I go, oh, good day. Good deletion day today. Come on, that's great. Now, I don't feel guilt. I don't feel shame. Because I haven't killed anybody, I've just deleted an email. Cool. Seven. Noted. Now, through much of the last 20 years of my life, about once a fortnight, I receive a three or a five or a ten page email from somebody explaining to me how truly dreadful I am. Now I got my first one of these fantastic emails, such optimism, got one of these fantastic emails from a woman in the year 2000 and sadly can I say sociologically most of them do come from women which is interesting in itself and this woman in the year 2000 explained to me precisely uh, what was wrong with me as a human and she took five and a half pages to do it and of course she had emailed pretty well the entirety of the institution I was working at and basically people I could have been related to in a previous life so just about everybody got it now fa so, I, so I'd got this email a young very young academic very inexperienced academic very junior and she was very senior now the consequences of this email for her were catastrophic. She was moved out of the organisation within weeks. Okay. Now, the reason for that probably is, look, I'm a pretty decent person. I don't do a lot of harm, really. Maybe some sort of harm to fashion, but I don't do too much harm. And look, I pretty well like everybody. I'm not going to go get terribly aggressive with anybody. Very few issues really worry me at all. So when a dreadful email arrives, explaining that I am Satan on a meth scrag, then often that person is not believed. 
Uh, and to be frank with you, in the, that first case and in most cases ever since, I don't have to do too much in response to those emails because all the other people who have been CC'd into it invariably do something. They reply to that person, send it on to HR, send it on to the Vice Chancellor, send it on to their boss, right? And invariably, of course, these days get a screen grab and put it on Facebook, going well. So the email response from my colleagues was incredible. Now, I hadn't done anything at this point. I waited a whole day. Remember, I was a young academic at that point. I was going, what is going on, right? And I didn't really know, as a young person, what do you do when someone is sort of five Chardonnays to the wind and they decide to send you an email explaining how much they hate you? And I did something 20 years ago that I've done to every one of these emails ever since. So the email went on and on and on, page after page after page. And I simply hit reply, not reply all, reply. And I, I replied with one word, noted. And then my signature. Now I've used that strategy for two decades. Whenever I get one of these war and peace emails, my staff now refer to it as the Brabazon noted email. So I get one of these and I reply noted with my signature. So whenever you get one of these crazy emails, and look, we all get them, we all get them, don't spend one minute, don't spend one minute getting emotionally distraught or involved in this other person's drama. That's their drama, it's not yours. Read it, recognize, yep, five Chardonnays to the wind, cool, reply, noted, out of there. And you'll see how your life will change with one word noted eight use the one minute rule now this has also been studied this is valuable use the one minute rule this is the big bit of advice that probably will change your life particularly if you're looking at your inbox and it's a mess right now okay you're looking to go i will never get control of this right the one minute rule will get you back in control so the one minute rule is if you read an email and you can reply to it in one minute then reply to it in real time you've read it I can reply to this quickly, reply quickly, then delete it or file it. Now, if it requires detail and attention, so it's one of those that might be a life-changing message, then, you know, think freedom of information request, think lawyers, then you know what? Do absolutely take the time and answer it properly. Now, this one-minute rule will actually change your life. So you've read it. Your brain has processed it, you've read it, you can reply quickly, one line, absolutely do it every single time. Now, the reason we do this is that it takes longer to read an email than it does to answer it. So once you've read it, and if you can reply quickly, do it, and then it's out of your life. This is called Ohio. This is the Ohio rule. Only handle it once. Ohio change your life. So when you're returning to what is a pretty simple email over and over again, you're wasting an enormous amount of time. So touch it once, answer it, delete it or file it. Ta. Nine. Here it is. Here it is. Unsubscribe from everything. <laughs> now this is an obvious one. We all know you bought something in 2008, right? And that company has used your email and sent you a weekly email ever since 2008. You know, Tim, you might have got that cheap jacket, you might have downloaded that software in 2012. And then this means because of those buying decisions, 30 seconds of your week, every week, for the rest of your life, will be spent simply deleting the spam. So unsubscribe to everything seriously it's over email is not the way to sell anything now obviously please I hope you've disabled all social media notifications social media at work is bad enough the idea that you're then getting a notification about social media to your email is again the path to madness so you don't need those emails, you don't need those newsletters, you don't need those blogs, you don't need those news feeds, you don't need them. Life is too short. An email is not your world. It is a platform for work communication. 
10. Lead from the front. Lead from the front. All of us complain about email. But are you part of the problem as much as part of the solution? Are you one of those people, I'm looking at you, are you one of those people that hit reply all to every email? Are you those people? You will burn in hell. You know you will burn in hell. So you know what? Stop hitting reply all. For all of us as a family, stop doing that. Never, never show how great you are by sending emails to your boss or your supervisor. Team, you reckon you got it tough. Try being your supervisor. Try being your boss. You reckon you're getting a lot of emails. Think about that. So whenever you think, oh, I'll, I'll send this on to my supervisor. Don't, really. Don't. Not needed. Have a nice email folder. File it. That's great. Do that. Don't overshare. Less is more. In emails, team, less is always, always more. Don't complain about the emails that you send. Um, if you receive a lot, if you receive a lot and you send a lot, there's not a surprise. If you're trying to reduce the traffic, send fewer emails. It is that old line, be the change you want to see. Be the change you want to see. Now, team, one of the reasons we did the email, uh, we did the vlog this week, is because emails are radically changing now. The research has shown even in the last three years, let alone the last five years, emails have jumped the shark. They have jumped the shark. Now, we all know as a culture that we're wasting far too much time with emails. And the research is showing our behavior is now changing. Now, let's just go through this research. A two, and noting that, of course, COVID is challenging and we're still understanding post-COVID how email will settle. But let's go to just before COVID. So in the 2017 annual consumer email report showed that email users are checking emails 27% less than they did in 2016. So there was a 27% change in one year alone. So the biggest change in the behavior was the checking of emails outside of work. So that behavior is now radically reducing. Isn't that brilliant? Great. So for example, I love this stat too. This was great. Only 80%, 80, only 80% of work emails are even opened and only 60% of personal emails are even opened. So the dreadful habit, oh, can you imagine, of checking your emails in bed. Who are these people? But this dreadful habit has been shown to reduce, uh, it's reduced 28% since 2016. That's great. And 26% of workers now don't check their emails outside of work. So this is, this is a huge change. They're big numbers, right? So as you can see, our work culture fantastically is changing. So we need to all be the change that we want to see. If you need to rescue yourself and rescue your time, then that rescue probably does commence with emails. This change is going to start with you. Noted. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.